Hi, I'm Russ and I'm giving a presentation on Amazon Web Services for .NET Peeps. Uh, there's my contact details there. Uh, at Russ Oz is my Twitter account and I have a blog at tinoz.com. So I was going to present some slides on all the different services coming from Amazon but I've worked out it's just going to take too much time. Uh, I'm going to drill down onto the services that I've had experience with. I've used these services to develop an iPhone app of mine and uh, have have a chat, an introduction to each and then jump into Visual Studio and do some coding and show these things being used in in the real world. So the first one there on the list is Amazon Elastic Compute Cloud. That is infrastructure as a service, so virtual servers. Think of it as VMware, but you're operating VMware inside one of Amazon's data centers, so you can fire up your virtual machines and pay by the hour, and so much more. There's a lot of cool stuff in there. Uh, skipping down to the last bullet point, elastic load balancing. So that's your virtual load balancer in the cloud. Um, so you create five EC2 instances as your web services, or web servers, and then a virtual load balancer in front of them to balance the load across the five of them. So when a web when a web browser connects, it's actually connecting off to the load balancer and that's forwarding the requests onto the web servers and it has features like you can check the uptime of your web servers and take them out of the farm if they ever go down. And also SSL termination, so you can hand over your SSL certs and pub, uh, private keys so that all the SSL handshake and encryption occurs between the browser and the load balancer, just taking that load off of your servers. Uh, under storage is Amazon Simple Storage Service, or S3. Uh, that's just a... Play One second, sorry. Just make sure I'm recording. Uh, S3 is a place to store files out there on the cloud, highly durable. Amazon manage all the redundancy for you, so you just send it up there and you know it's going gonna, it's gonna to stay there. Um, next one is Amazon Elastic Block Store. Those are the virtual disks that you go and attach to your EC2 instance. So you fired up an instance, you want to put some additional disks on it, you create uh, EBS block stores. There's an interesting statistic there, uh, annual failure rate of between 0.1 and 0.5%. So this is saying that these disks do fail. It's not the cloud service with multiple redundancy. This is all the tools to build your own redundancy, but it's, it's infrastructure as a service. It's the same as having a server and having disks attached to it, but with, with a much lower failure rate than you'd expect from commodity disks there. Workforce, so Amazon Mechanical Turk. That's something I've had to describe to my mum. I just described it as it's a jobs board that Amazon have where people around the world are sitting in browsers and you can give them small little tasks to perform for a price. You can pay them to do these little tasks. And that's something else that I'll be able to demo at the end of this presentation. I'll skip over these. Amazon CloudFront, that's a CDN, so you're probably all familiar with CDN. It's a place to put all your static and streaming content. So it's cached at edge locations around the world. All the blue dots there on that map represent the edge locations for, C for the CDN. So I could set up my website so all the JPEGs and all the JavaScript are served from the CDN. And someone coming in to access my site from Australia will via some DNS latency based routing, some DNS tricks. Uh, they would get the static content served from their closest server. So, yep, someone in Australia would get the content served from Sydney, and it's extremely fast. That's something else I can demo. Uh, I will skip over all of these and get to this. So, the question here is, all these great services, how do you use them? There is a web GUI, the EC2 Management Console. It's very very nice looking web GUI and everything you would ever want to do you can do from there so um, create up your instances create your cloud front distributions manage all your S3 folders and files you can do it from there but this is alt.net and we're the guys who want to tinker so I'm going to concentrate on how you would do all these things via the API like I said um, 
the majority of what you'd ever want to do, you'd do via this. But the API exists so you can automate tasks or build your own tools to uh, interact with these services. Uh, how do you talk to the API? There is what Amazon calls query requests, which is like a REST API. SOAP requests for web, uh, web service clients. And for us .NET guys, there's a C-sharp library which will actually manufacture those query requests for you. And I'm going to give a quick demo here in Visual Studio of exactly what those query requests look like. So this actual demo, this actual demo is showing you what the SDK or the library does for you. But it's worth knowing just how these things interact. Yep, so everything I'm doing here is very easy to do via the SDK, but let's have a look at how this stuff works. Those first two lines there are the key and the secret access key. Those are credentials given to you by Amazon when you create your AWS account. Um, there is a whole nother service to create uh, as many access keys as you want and apply access control rules to them. That's called the IAM, which is something unfortunately I don't have time for. So, first thing I'm doing there is formatting a timestamp using ISO 8601 standard. Here's the URL that I'm going to hit. And the convention of that URL inside it is the location of the Amazon data center I want to talk to. Uh, now a query string style post data is the actual payload. In there, the action, so the method that I want to call, in this case describes spot price history. The parameters I'm going to pass in, so this method wants a start time and end time, a, a, an availability zone, product description, instance type, so I'm saying go get me all the prices for Linux, small Linux boxes in this location. And then there's some standard parameters that they every method expects, which is my access key, the version of the signature I'm going to use, and a timestamp. So yep, signature, I have to prove I am who I say I am. I, this could be a method to go and create like a server. We don't want anyone just creating a server on my behalf. So how do you create the signature? Here's what I'm going to sign. It's a combination of the HTTP action, the domain I'm trying to hit, a slash, and then the canonicalized parameters. So all of the parameters taken and put it put into byte order. Uh, replace out all the Windows style new lines with the Unix style. And compute a SHA-256 HMAC with that secret access key that I've established with Amazon and that's going to generate some basics for gobbledygook which I add on to the query string. And now just with a vanilla web client I'm going to go and post that up to Amazon to that URL and the response I get back is an XML blob of all those prices that I want to get back from Amazon. So with it, there we go, that's how you would talk to the services if you're working on some platform where there's no SDK or maybe you need to debug the SDK, it's worth knowing how all that stuff works. So back to the slides, the next thing I'm going to show is EC2, so that's the virtual server hosting. Some of the concepts, some of the terminology that you'll hear when people are talking about EC2 is AMI, that's the machine image. So again, like your VMware software, you have all your machine images. Up in the cloud, there's Amazon have created a whole bunch of machine images, different Windows server configurations, and people can go and create their own images and make them public, actually. So that there's lots and lots of images to choose from. Key pairs, that's a public-private key that in the Unix world, that's actually what you would use to SSH into your box. In the Windows world, that's what we use to communicate with Amazon to grab the administrator password of a newly created server. Security groups, looks like your firewall rules. 
uh, elastic IP addresses. That's a way of reserving an IP address. So you've registered mywebsite.com. You want to hold on to that IP address, and Amazon will let you do that with an elastic IP. And you can hold on to the IP even if it's not associated with the machine or associated with any one of the machines. Regions. So that map that I showed before. Yeah, the big yellow dots represent all the different locations where Amazon have data centers, and they're referred to a lot in this convention, EU West in Dublin, uh, South America East and South Palo, and then Virginia, Tokyo, Oregon, and Northern California, and Asia Pacific would be in Singapore. Um, instance types, not all instances are created equal, so you can start off with a tiny micro instance, very low spec server, or all the way up to high CPU, high memory instances, clusters, GPU, there's even instances where you have access to a physical NVIDIA GPU, I've seen people use that for like uh, hash cracking, uh, very CPU intensive stuff that's all handed over to the GPU. And a brand new one, high I.O., where you're guaranteed SSD drives. Of course, they come at different prices, so I can get into that. So now, uh, an EC2 demo. Again, this is something you could do from the web UI, but here's how you do it in code. SSD. those credentials that we saw last time around this time are actually in my config file I don't feel like showing those off uh, so what am I going to do, the first thing I'm doing is creating a prefix because there's a couple of things in here that need to be uniquely named and I, while I'm testing this I've run it about a hundred times so I'm creating the client here I'm calling describe images which is those AMIs that I was talking about before. This will give me back a list of all the AMIs. Uh, that might be a bit hard to see, but the response described image result has come back with 65 images. And just to look at one, here's one. That's uh, x8664 uh, Microsoft Server 2008 R2 SP1 data center there's all the different AMIs that you can fire up. Uh, the next thing I'm going to do is create a security group. This is where all of our firewall rules are going to live. So the method I called there was create security group and as parameters that takes a group name and a group description. And there we go, it's told me it's come back to me with an ID. That's important because I'll be using that to call the next method, authorize security group ingress. This is where I'm telling Amazon I want to allow remote desktop into this box. And the parameters I pass to that is a group ID from the group I just created, a CIDR IP, which is the IP address range I'm going to allow in. In this example, I'm letting the entire internet in. Not a good idea. And from port to port 3389, which is the remote desktop, port and the protocol is TCP. It's called that method and it's added the ingress floor. Okay next I'm going to create the key pair. Again maybe this is an odd thing to do from the API. You can do it all from the web. And also if you have you can save your own servers as AMIs and if you've gone and created an administrator password, you don't need a key pair at all. This, I'm only using this to retrieve a password from an Amazon AMI. And it just, it just spat out my private key. That's what it looks like a normal RSA private key. Now, I'm finally going to tell it to run up an instance. The method here is run instances. The parameters that takes is the number of instances I want, in this case only one, the AMI ID, which we saw before from that describe instances, 
the key name, the key I just created, and the instance type I'm just going to create a small. And the very last parameter there is the security groups, which is actually multiple. You can pass in multiple security groups, and the server will get the union of all those rules. In this case, it's only that one group that's going to allow remote desktop in. And that's been called. It's launched our instance. It's given back an instance ID there. And it's going to take it a few minutes before the server is up and warm and I'm able to go and pick up that password. Notice, I've noticed um, Linux ones come up very, very fast. So I've written a bit of code here to just keep trying to get that admin password. It's not going to appear for a little while, so I think I'll just pause the presentation here. Okay, and we're back. Um, I'm now getting the encrypted password back from Amazon. And if I allow it to proceed it's going to enter into this where it's calling a get decrypted password so the SDK itself has some code in there to decrypt what we're getting back and there it is, there's our admin password the next method I'm going to call is describe instances just so I can go and grab the uh, IP address of our newly created server Describe instances and the parameter that's taking is just the instance ID of that one instance we're running. And there we go. Here's the address. So just to show off our new server. Well, we might just stop into it. we go, we're logging into our brand new server. Pretty cool, huh? And that's a um, small Windows instance. I think that's going to cost us like 11 cents to run that server for an hour. What's next? Okay, how much does it cost? Um, different instances are different prices. Uh, there's all the standard instance. As they grow, it goes from 1.7 gig to 15 gig of RAM. CPUs are measured in EC2 compute units. Uh, the one we're looking at right now is one. With just within the standard instances, we can go up to four. We've got up to eight with four virtual cores. Uh, they're differentiated by bigger disk and you can get instances with uh, improved I.O. Uh, the micro instance is the very cheapest, which is a very low spec server. And then they're grouped by high memory and high CPU for different tasks. Maybe memory is more important for, probably for a database application, CPU for number crunching. And on to the next page, there's cluster instances where you have access to an actual physical processor, uh, cluster GPU that has an actual physical NVIDIA chip available to it. That's the one I've seen used for uh, hash cracking. There's applications ready to go to run on those instances. And the new one is high I.O. where you're guaranteed two one terabyte SSD drives to get very, very fast I.O. on those. Um, Okay, so you also, if you're going to add additional disks, you're going to pay for that. It's 10 cents per gig a month, and you pay 10 cents per million I.O. requests. You also pay for data transfer. Data coming in is free. The first gig in a month is free. 
and then up to 10 terabytes you're paying 12 cents a gig for data out that is so that's what data that your web server is putting out that kind of stuff reserved instances it's another way to bring the price down you can pay up front an amount of money and this example here for a small windows instance uh, if you pay $300 up front and lock into a three year term your hourly rate drops to 3.3 cents an hour okay next topic is S3 and this is just somewhere to store your files up on the cloud where Amazon will handle all the redundancy for you and store it in multiple locations um, some concepts you'll hear here are buckets so that's one grouping of all your files and folders uh, ACLs that's the access control list so you can add rules on there to say who's allowed to look at what folders add to what folders those sort of things and secured content that's a cool concept that you can hand over a URL that contains a signature with a time to live on it so here's a link to display an image and it's only going to be valid for the next one minute that sort of thing uh, S3 demo so I also have some code here Finish and jump into the S3 demo. This again is using the AWS SDK. There it is there, that project that I've added to this solution. You get all the source code for that. So let's zoom in on that a bit. Kick that off. Again, I'm creating a prefix, I'm firing up the S3 client, I'm creating a bucket name, which needs to be unique, and a key. So the key is effectively the folder plus file name. Now I'm going to call put bucket. So this is a REST API where HTTP methods have meaning, and a HTTP put means go and create something. And I'm going to create that bucket. So we create the bucket, and I'm going to put an object into that bucket, and the parameters there. Oops, are the bucket name, the file on my local machine, and the key. How do you access it? Well, a HTTP GET is how you can access it and the URL that you're going to hit is the combination of the bucket name plus s3.amazonaws.com plus key that's the URL I can hit if I copy that and try and look at that in a browser form which is performing a HTTP GET on it I actually get an access denied message that's because of the ACLs I was talking about by default no one other than myself is going to look at it and this is effectively an anonymous request so one cool feature is that you can craft up a signed URL so here's the method that will give me back the signature to put on that URL and I pass into that and expires now plus one minute the bucket name and the key and there we go, that has given me a giant URL with a signature attached, which is only going to be valid for one minute. I've seen social media sites use something like that, that um, someone's just taken a photo in Foursquare, it gets posted to their Facebook profile, and when you follow the link from Facebook, they're going to give you, they don't know who you are, so they're going to give you an image that you can only view for a few seconds. It's just one way of securing content. Okay, and I can actually go ahead and just make an image, and make the image public so anyone can view it in a web browser. People, people do actually use S3 to store like the images within their website. Now if I go back to the URL that before, there's the old access denied, and refresh on that, you can see that, fine. Ok, 
Okay, the next thing I was going to show off is CloudFront, that's Amazon's CDN. And what we're going to end up with here is creating a CDN distribution, which is a mapping to say they're going to give us back a URL or a domain that we'll be able to access our content when it's on the CDN. And to do that, I create a mapping to say this distribution, requests that come into this distribution, go and retrieve the files from this location. And in this case, the location we're retrieving from is that S3 bucket that I just created. It doesn't have to be an S3 bucket. It could be any web server. Uh, here is all the setup for that. The majority of this code is just setting defaults. The interesting bit here is the origin. So I'm saying for this distribution, the original files should be picked up from this bucket. The bucket we just created. Create distribution, and that's going to give me back a domain name. Now I should be able to access that domain name and any requests to that are going to get mapped to static content over my bucket. And interestingly, um, the CDN is not limited to static content. It can even act as a CDN for streaming, for flash streaming servers and IIS smooth streaming. It's very cool stuff. Um, that domain is going to take time to propagate. This website just ping will take a domain. I didn't copy that properly. This website will take that domain. I can see this one. Tested this a few times. It's going to take that and ping that from a whole bunch of different locations. And the way CDNs work is via the uh, latency based routing on the DNS different people are going to get different IPs back which is going to send them off to the closest edge location of the CDN that takes time to propagate so I'll just pause the presentation here okay so we're back and that domain has propagated if I ping that we'll see from different locations around the world we're getting different IPs back and if I do that from here Beautiful, I'm getting a 54 address, and look at these pings, 21, 22, that was a good ping on a LAN not too long ago, that, that's extremely fast. So, if I now go back to that file that I was serving from S3, and put in my CloudFront domain, this file's now getting served from the CDN, so people around the world are going to get that much quicker. It wasn't super quick the first time because it does take time to go and retrieve that from S3. If I control F5 on that, that comes through extremely fast. I think that's like a 200k file. And that's the end of the S3 demo. What does it cost? Um, so you're going to pay for storage, the first terabyte month is 12 and a half cents for standard there's also reduced redundancy where they they don't store as many copies of your file so you pay a little bit less for that you pay for requests um, one cent per 1000 put copy post and list request get requests which is the important one that someone hitting it in a browser cost you one cent for per 10,000 requests you pay also for data transfer um, all data in so files that you're sending to s3 is free data coming out the first gig a month is free and up to 10 terabytes you're going to pay 12 cents per gig okay next topic is mechanical turk uh, like i said this is a jobs board that amazon have that you can go put little tasks out there for workers around the world to complete and pay them to do these little tasks uh, um, some of the concepts you'll hear here are HIT, the human intelligence task. That's the little thing that you're putting out there for people to do. I've seen pictures of business cards. Go enter all the details about this business card for me. I've seen people put an e-commerce website put up address with some checkboxes saying 
tick what type of dress this is. Uh, I've seen people put up images. Please uh, crop this image and rotate it. Uh, millions of different things I've seen. Classify this Arabic. Is it Saudi Arabian, Lebanese, or Syrian Arabic? It's just millions of cool little things going on there. Um, next concept, the worker. That's the person who's actually going to complete the task. Assignment. So when you create a hit, you can tell Amazon, for this hit, create 10 assignments. So get 10 people to complete this hit, and Amazon will randomize that for you. So 10 different people complete your hit, and you can average the result or pick the most popular result. It's a nice little built-in built feature. The reward, that's what you're going to pay the worker. And qualifications. So when you create a hit, you can attach to it some qualifications to say, uh, I only want people in this country to complete, or I don't want people from this particular country, and you can create your own qualifications. So as you approve jobs, you can assign a worker a qualification to say, this guy is an 80 out of 100 for performing clipping paths. You've assigned the qualification, so next time you create hits, you can say, make this hit only visible to people who have a qualification of this level. Uh, how much does it all cost? So you're going to pay 10% of what you're paying to the workers goes to Amazon. Uh, now I can give a little code demo. Okay. Uh, in this particular case, I'm not using the SDK from Amazon. I'm using an, a Codeplex project for it. It's not included in the Amazon SDK for some reason. So what I'm going to do here before I do I, I'll just give a quick let's quickly show you what the workers see. This is the web UI where workers are coming in and completing tasks. Here's one that I'm not qualified to work on because I don't have the qualification for it. Um, here's one, keyword search, number of hits, so there's 14,000 hits this guy's created for people to complete, 16 cents each. Lots and lots of stuff. So now I'm going to create some hits myself via the API. What I've got here is an array of images of animals that I've kind of grabbed off Wikipedia. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to display a UI to a worker. I'll show them a single image and some radio buttons to say, tell, tell me what animal you see here. Uh, one of my first thoughts was how, how do you build this UI that you're going to show the workers? And there's three ways you can do it. What I'm doing here when I create the hit, I'm going to include in the XML a question form, which is Amazon's little XML language of building up the UI. And in this particular case, I'm giving a title, what animal do you see below? A binary, I can stick an image in there and see I've got a little placeholder there for where I'm going to put all those Wikipedia URLs in. And I'm going to ask a single question which is mandatory, that's an important one to turn on, and question content and answer specifications. So I'm going to give min, max, selection count, so they have to pick one radio button from the following options, elephant, zebra, giraffe, possum, tiger, all that sort of stuff. That is what's called a question form. There is now also a HTML form, so instead of this XML here, I could put whatever HTML I want, and in the form tag, action that off to Amazon, and when I go to retrieve my results, I will get back all of the form variables that were in that HTML. And the third way of doing it is an external question, where the XML blob I built here would be external question and a pointer to my own web server. So that's the way that you can integrate your own code into these questions. Just your own code would be displayed inside an iframe to these workers. Uh, let's run that up. So, 
down here is where I'm going to go and create this. Create this, yes. Uh, so I'm going to loop through those images. String.format, so I'm going to take that XML, stick my image in there. And then call create hit. So the methods to that is the title, a little bit of blurb, select the animal you see in the picture below, the reward, one cent, and that question XML. And the last parameter is the number of assignments, five. So I'm going to get five people to complete this hit. Uh, the hit's been created and it's come back to me with hit ID. I need a breakpoint down to here. You can let that go off and create all the hits. And I have to be quick, I already have bookmarked here a search for hits created by me. There they are. One hit available. Is that what it is? Okay, view a hit in this group. And I have to click accept because there's some form of optimistic blocking going on here to make sure two people aren't complete, completing the same thing. What animal do you see below? Let me see if there's a Finish hit. Okay, your results have been submitted and it's automatically offering another one to me there. If I return to that, these will disappear quite quick now. It's time there's six available. And I can now show you the API where I go and retrieve my answers. So at this point, not too far away, there we go, doesn't match, they've all been picked up. Either they've been completed or someone's clicked that accept button and it's in that optimistic lock phase. Um, how do I go and retrieve my results? So there's a method there, get all hits. And I'm only interested in the name, the animal hits. And it's going to tell me, there's the hit ID, the number of assignments remaining zero. They've all been picked up. Now I call the method get all assignments for hit. And if there is an answer, the answer comes back to me as an XML blob. And I've got a bit of X document code there to go and pull out the bit that I'm interested in. And spit that out on the console. So our very first answer was an elephant. And if I let that run, it's going to spit out the answers that have already come in. Isn't that amazing? They're already there. And everyone appears... Ah, there's one person who won't agree. There's one person who thinks... A baboon is a giraffe. Um, possum's good, kangaroo's good, giraffe, chimpanzee. People are getting good at this. Um, usually they get confused by the Australian animals there. Okay, so I've got all my results. Uh, it's time to go and approve them. So there's an API to come in and approve them. This is the point where I could also assign a qualification to a worker, but I'm not going to get into that. Uh, very similar to the code we were looking at before. Get all the hits. I'm only interested in the name, the animal hits. Uh, time to get all the assignments again. If the assignment isn't already approved, I'm going to call the method approve assignment. That takes the assignment ID and a mandatory message. In this case, I'm just going to say thanks. And there we go, approved. And after I've approved all the assignments for a hit, I go off and dispose the hit, just effectively deleting it, get it getting it out of all the, my UIs and reports that I see. And it's going to chug through and approve those hits, approve the assignments, and then dispose of the hit. So my next slide, any time left? Unfortunately not. 
So that's the end of the presentation. Any questions, my contact details are there at the start of the presentation. Shoot me an email. Um, thanks for listening.